This is the Definitely Uncertain Podcast, brought to you by Gold Rock Capital. Each week, we look at how high net worth families can improve their lives, decisions, and investments in a deeply uncertain world. We always aim to provide practical information, even if we can't offer specific investment advice. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of the Definitely Uncertain Podcast. My name is Darren Rockman, and I'm a partner with Gold Rock Capital, the 20-year-old multifamily office servicing high net worth investors around the world. And I am very, very privileged to have on the show this morning, Jeffrey Sachs, who is the EMEA Head of Investment Strategy at City Private Bank. Uh, Jeffrey, welcome. Thank you, Darren. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we're very, very pleased you are. So we are going to talk about investment strategy and investment allocation and some specific things that are going on in the investment world. Clearly this year has been a wild and difficult year for investors and a lot of things have changed from where we were back at the end of 2019. Um, one of the things that's happened, of course, is that interest rates around the globe have plummeted um, and effectively we are at zero interest rates in almost every Western economy. And that means that there's been very little money to be made by investors, either in government bonds or in corporate bonds. So where are you advising clients to go uh, to make some type of yield in this environment? Well, very selectively, we're funding opportunities in high yield and emerging market debt mainly. But just starting at, at the the reason for why rates are so low, at the start of this year, we felt that rates couldn't go lower, but but they have because governments need to finance their fiscal expansions cheaply. So our base case is that the central banks will continue to be accommodative over the medium to long term, which means low rates for longer, even lower and longer than we envisaged in January. And the second thing that's happened during the last six months is that the central banks have increased their quantitative easing policies. In other words, they're buying more bonds than they were already buying in January of this year, which is putting downward pressure on bond deals. So what we've seen over the last few months with initially the, the flight into safe havens like treasuries, they've had tremendous rallies, but they now look fully priced. So in areas like treasuries, we've moved to neutral. In government sovereigns more generally, we're underweight. Something like a 10-year German Bund yielding minus 50 basis points, you wouldn't buy it and hold it to maturity because you're guaranteed to lose money. So you need to be selective. And if you look at the areas I briefly mentioned, starting with high yield, well, in the US and Europe, you've still got positive yield. And that's what investors first and foremost are looking for. And that's despite rallies of 20% plus in high yield in US and Europe year to date. So if you take Europe as an example, the high yield space has moved in yield down from 10 to 4.5% spreads are down to 420 basis points. But that is still in absolute terms decent and in relative terms really attractive. And what's interesting is that the central bank buying in sovereigns and investment grade is trickling down into high yield because sellers of those sovereigns and investment grade are keeping their fixed income exposure and buying high yield. Secondly, you've got another source of buying, and that's these investors scrambling for positive yield. We're seeing it in the new issue market most dramatically, where we've had corporates looking to issue to take advantage of lower coupons that they can achieve. So the issuance program has been huge, while at the same time, the response from the market has been even bigger. So that's telling us that demand for anything yielding positive is, is there. And the default cycle is muted. It's turning upwards, but only slowly. And that's because of the policy accommodation that we've got in place. And leverage for this stage of a cycle, we think for early stage, is only modest. So selectively in high yield, we're finding opportunities. We particularly prefer so-called fallen angels. Those are investment grade bonds that have fallen into the high yield space. Right. If you look at emerging, sorry, Darren. So I, I just want to pick up on a point you were making before about default. So of course the, the issue with high yield is these tend to be 
uh, not as strong companies and therefore the risk that investors are taking that they will lose money if the company goes into bankruptcy. Uh, how do you see that default cycle? You're saying it's muted at the moment, but how does that look out over the next uh, tw- year or two? Are investors really, even at 4%, are investors getting paid for the risk that they're taking? We think they are, and we think that it is average 4% at the moment in, in Europe and uh, around the same number in the US. We think it's going to trend to 6 to 8 over the next 12 to 18 months. So what we're emphasizing to our clients is to be selective within the high-yield space. You've still got 90% of the universe that's <clears throat> unlikely to default. And what's interesting about what COVID has done is that it's much more clearly differentiating the winners from the losers at the corporate level. And in particular, those with balance sheet strength and cash flow strength are likely to survive. And there's still a decent universe of those. Right. Okay. Um, I think emerging market debt is worth just spending a minute on. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Again, we've had a terrific rally, but there's further to go. We think some of the macro risks in emerging are mispriced. While they're still facing pressures, credit risk-related pressures and COVID pressures, we think that the pricing reflects that to a large extent, especially in dollar bonds, and we prefer the the quasi-sovereign bonds, so those are corporates partly owned by governments. And we're also finding opportunities in local emerging market debt because we like the outlook for some of the emerging market currencies, given that our dollar view is cautious and and those emerging currencies will be beneficiaries. So that's the second area that we like within the fixed income market. But broadly, we're cautious. One of the risks always in emerging markets is what happens if we ended up with interest rates ballooning and particularly at the long end, so longer term interest rates, 10, 5, 10 years, and the ability of uh, emerging market uh, economies to then be able to pay the rates that they need to pay on uh, those longer dated uh, uh, instruments. Do you see any risk of that in the next few years? Certainly not in the next few months. We're seeing a cyclical pickup, but it's a slow, gradual pickup. And that's being held back by COVID-related forces. And we think that will continue. So no massive spike in yields is expected. I think something else that's important is the Fed swap lines introduced in April have supported countries, especially in emerging and also companies, individuals with dollar liabilities. So that that will be a supportive factor. And I think what's finally interesting. Just, uh, maybe explain those swap lines simply, if you can, uh, for the listeners. Well, th- they enable uh, countries and individuals and corporates that have got do- dollar liabilities to access the dollars that they need more easily through the swap lines that have been introduced. And we had real stress in that area in late March and a scramble for dollars. And that's what took the dollar sharply higher at that time. And it's eased slightly. So that's helpful. And I think the other thing with emerging that's notable is that at the moment, we've seen real stress in countries like Argentina and Turkey, but no contagion and a domino effect throughout emerging like we've seen historically during difficult periods for emerging markets. And that's telling us that it's a maturing asset class, a more discerning, longer term investor base. So we think selectively in the months ahead, emerging market bonds will give us some buying opportunities and and good entry points, especially as the dollar weakens. Okay. So switching now from bonds to the stock market, you're you're, uh, sitting there in London and Europe really has been uh, out of favour and has not performed uh, for many, many years. And uh, I think I've sort of lost count of the number of times where uh, everybody's thought or some people have thought that that is over. Um, But the US still outperforms largely this year on the back of the tech stocks, which are becoming a larger and larger part of the big indices of the S&P 500 uh, sitting at around a quarter of that index. What is your view as to Europe going forward. Now, is it finally time for European uh, stocks to shine? Yes, it is finally time. And we think it's more than a trade. It's a long-term recovery that's in its very early stages. 
there's going to be a gradual perception change from investors. So it's not too late to get in. What's interesting, take the last 10 days trading when we've had a weak US market. And typically when the US is weak, it catches a cold. We get flu in, in European equities overnight <laughs> and a massive collapse. Jeffrey, we're not allowed to use that analogy anymore. We can't talk about coughs and spit and sneezes. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to use it today because it didn't happen last week. Europe did not catch flu. It was resilient. And that's telling us a few things. One, ownership levels are low. Two, the owners that we do have in Europe are longer term. And thirdly, we actually did see some buying in some areas of the European markets during the last week. So we think there's rotation that's in its early stages. But what's behind this? Very briefly, we think that European growth is now really well supported by governments that are, for the first time, being aggressive with their expansion programs. And related to that, the recovery fund that they introduced, 750 billion euros, is hugely positive and significant because, for the first time, there was firstly solidarity across the EU that they should give grants to the periphery. 390 of the 750 are grants to the periphery. So the solidarity is important. It bodes well for the future of Europe and more structural change yeah. that's clearly needed. But secondly, more importantly, in the near term, it gives a floor to the periphery growth and financial assets. And that's been a material risk for the last decade. And in particular, the currency-related risks emanating from a weak periphery are now no longer there. The eurozone breakup risk is no longer there. So you've got policy supporting growth and the periphery. Thirdly, you've got low ownership levels. Fourthly, you've got exciting areas, particularly within equities, that we think at a global level are looking more interesting and Europe is well exposed to them. Well, what, In particular- what, 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 Yeah, go. What, what are some of those uh, areas? Well, we like the outlook for what we call COVID cyclicals, value, small and medium cap companies. And let me just briefly elaborate on, on each. Uh, COVID cyclicals, at the start of the pandemic, we defined our global equity universe into COVID defensives, which included technology, areas benefiting from the pandemic and healthcare, those sorts of areas, and COVID cyclicals. And our view is that given the rally in the former, it's now time to move into COVID cyclicals. And Europe has got a 55% average weighting in COVID cyclicals. Secondly, the rally that we saw in the second quarter globally, but also in parts of Europe, was led by growth stocks. And we think now there's going to be a gradual shift into value. And Europe has got about 60% of its total universe defined as value. We've, within City Private Bank, redefined what value is in a global pandemic environment. We include, for example, stocks that are growing their dividends. Mm. We include a valuation measure called the PEG ratio. So that's the price to earnings in relation to EPS growth. And we include areas that will benefit from, from government support. So a slightly revised definition of value, but Europe is well exposed. And then thirdly, the mid cap area is an area that typically does well in the early stages of uh, economic pickup, which we're in, but also within Europe, we've gone back historically and looked at how that sector has performed in the first 12 months after a sharp decline. So this has been a sharp decline in April, May, and typically the subsequent 12 months on average give us close to a 50% return in mid caps compared to something like 37% uh, in large cap. So we like large cap, but we like SMID for more aggressive investors. It gives us slightly more uh, beta right. and, and upside. Can, we, can I take you back to the first of those three, the COVID cyclicals? Can you give us one or two examples of companies that would fit into that category for you? Well, at the sector level, we're looking at areas like, firstly, energy, secondly, financials, thirdly, industrials. So if you take industrials as an example, Siemens in Germany, the industrial company broadly exposed, not just to the domestic economy, but also as an exporter, it's going to benefit from the economic pickup. And in particular, the pickup in Asia, which is happening first. And our work shows 
that exporters from Europe, especially a country like Germany, have got a really close correlation with Asian economic growth. Right. If you look at the, the bank sector, typically they perform uh, with the cycle and the average European price to book is 0.5. And the balance sheet strength is really decent. The average core tier one is close to 12%. And a bank like uh, BNP Paribas gives us, along with that, uh, a very decent dividend yield. And uh, when you look at the outlook for European banks, lending growth will pick up from a really depressed level. It won't be super strong, but the rate of change will be decent in the coming months. And then looking further forward with a steepening yield curve, margin improvement, and ultimately, you can take a long-term view that because of the balance sheet strength, there'll be some provision right backs. And then the energy sector, we think benefits from consolidation in the sector that's happening gradually, but also a firmer oil price. Again, not super strong. It's going to be held back on the, on the top side of the range by supply coming back on stream. But a gradual pickup in demand supports the oil price at at least these levels that supports uh, well, two areas, uh, the traditional fossil fuel companies, which look attractively priced with dividend yields in many cases, but we also like the outlook for alternative energy where we can get exposure through some large caps that are moving into that area, but also through uh, smaller companies in that area. While we're talking about Europe, the uh, one of the concerns that you've heard recently as the tensions have increased between the US and China uh, around trade issues, uh, something we've talked about at a recent podcast. Um, one of the concerns you've heard is this is going to impact Europe because China is such a big market for European companies. How much do you think that there is uh, weight to that argument? And are European companies actually being able to change their markets and redirect their exports to reduce their dependence on China? We think it's the latter. And Another example of COVID accelerating a trend, it's accelerating the trend for companies to shift their supply chains. And a lot of European companies, like US companies, are moving more national. It's a slow process, but it's starting, it's accelerated now, and we think over time, that's going to be supportive for Europe more broadly. Something else we're watching quite closely is the US election, because should, for example, Joe Biden win and, and win decisively, we think that's going to be positive for Europe on the trade front. Uh, one of the initiatives that, that he will likely prioritize is rebuilding diplomatic and trade ties with Europe in the, in the coming months. Right. Well, is it, isn't, uh, isn't that an incredible world we live in where we have to talk about reestablishing trade ties between the United States and Europe? Um, Back to China for a second. One of uh, the what you call unstoppable trends um, has been the rise of the Chinese middle class. Um, how do investors take advantage of the internal changes within China, which have been going on for quite a long time, but seem to be continuing as more urbanization and people within the cities actually going up in, in, their, in their socioeconomic standing? Yes. As you say, it's been going on for a long time, but what's fascinating for us and giving us investment opportunities is that the trend has now reached a stage where within China, the GDP per capita levels of around 400 million Chinese people are approaching the stage or at the stage where those people are going out and buying cars and buying houses and everything that goes into the house and in some cases, buying the second car, and in some cases, moving further up the GDP per capita level and starting to buy luxury goods. Now, we think that that trend is also accelerating. And how do we play it? Well, there's essentially three ways. The first way, perhaps for a more risk-averse investor, would be to look at European and US companies that are selling to the Chinese middle class, particularly the luxury goods sector and, and related areas. Because then you've got the security of buying in your home market, 
with a company that you're probably familiar with, with a small portion of its business, not the entire business. So that's the first way. The second way would be to look to a domestic China fund that's got a high exposure level to that domestic sector. And there's not too many of these types of funds because over the years, China has been driven by the export cycle and many of the funds are focused there. But actually within the private bank, we've got a domestic focused China fund. And that's a play on, on the rising consumer spending. And the third way to get exposure is through looking at broad Asian exposure, perhaps through a pan-Asian fund or ETF. Because as the, Chi as the Chinese consumer starts to spend more, it's got multiplier impacts, not just in China, but more broadly. You've got those same Chinese people traveling to Thailand and Indonesia and the Philippines. Bank lending increases, not just in China, but to other parts of the region. And FDI flows from, from China into the rest of the region start to, start to pick up as well. So those are three ways that we, we look to address this. But I think the one point I would emphasize is that this is not just an unstoppable trend, but it's a long-term trend with drivers that are firmly underpinned. So we think that it's for a long-term investor and also an investor looking to add over time and on that point, I think technically there's an important factor that's supportive. The indices will keep raising their weightings for Chinese equity. At the moment, it's only 5% of global equity in the, in the global MSCI. It, it will surely rise. And on our analysis, investors are currently significantly below even the 5% level. So you've got a constant bid likely for Chinese equities in the months and years ahead. And, and that's why we think that it's going to be uh, very well underpinned. And, and valuations are supportive, very reasonable. Mm. And what about transparency and governance in China for Western investors who are used to Western standards? Um, do you see that there is enough good governance and enough transparency to give investors security to be buying direct equities in the Chinese market? There is enough in a good-sized universe of Chinese companies. And I'm referring to the large caps, many of which are now global companies, not just in terms of their business operations, but also in terms of where they raise their capital from. Mm. So they need to do global roadshows. And in doing so, they need to be transparent. And a lot of these companies have got uh, boards of governors, and the levels are close to, if not at, the levels that you'd expect from a typical Western company. I think for the mid-cap sector, we're certainly seeing improvements on the transparency and government levels, and the trend is well entrenched, but there's further to go. Okay. Well, Jeffrey, that's been hugely uh, interesting and uh, really uh, great to hear your perspective um, and as thoughtful uh, as always. So uh, thank you very, very much for joining the podcast today. It's been great to talk with you, Darren. Thank you very much indeed. Terrific. And uh, a thanks to our producer, Andrea Herman, and to our editor, Ido Schlesinger. Um, I'm Darren Rockman, and look forward to seeing you next time.